Hi everyone, Carl Steele here for English 3111, Brooklyn College, Fall 2022, Medieval English Literature, talking about a 14th century lay by Thomas Chester called Sir Lanval. First, I'm going to give you a quick plot summary of Thomas Chester's Sir Lanfall. So this is a story that takes place at Arthur's court, where there's, there's of course a knight named Lanval. He spends lavishly, and meanwhile, Arthur goes to Ireland to get a wife, Guinevere. There's a big wedding feast. Lanval doesn't really trust Guinevere because she's got a bad reputation. And when there are gifts being given out, Guinevere gives Lanval nothing. So he's offended. He decides to leave court. Arthur gives him a couple of noble companions to accompany him and a lot of money. Lanval goes to a nearby town and he's forced to live in bad accommodations. One gets a sense that his status is already diminished. The mayor of that town is in fact Lanval's former servant. He's also the one who owns the inn where Lanval is staying. And over the next year or so, he falls into debt. He's in deep poverty, his clothes are falling apart, and he sends his two noble companions away. He's invited to a party by the mayor's daughter, um, but he says, my clothes are just too messed up, and can I just borrow your horse? So he borrows her horse, he rides off into the woods, and he's just feeling sorry for himself, falls asleep under a tree, and then he sees nearby this beautiful woman with all this beautifully expensive clothing, and he's immediately attracted to her, and they become lovers, and she offers him basically infinite wealth, and a really nice horse, and an invisible servant who's going to help him out, and says that she will come to him whenever he wants her to, so long as he's in private, and he's not allowed to talk about her in public. So this is a very standard taboo that's put on him. And so he returns to Arthur's court. He puts on a gives away a lot of money, helps out all kinds of people, puts on a, a big tournament, and he's very, very success, successful at it. And then this enormous giant named Sir Valentine from Lombardy, Italy says, you know, I want you to come to Italy and have us fight there. So Lanval goes to Italy. He defeats the giant with the help of his invisible servant. He also kills all of Valentine's companions. And then he comes back to the court of King Arthur. Guinevere, seeing that Lanval is so wildly rich and popular, decides that he should be her next lover. So she propositions him. He says, no. He says, in fact, I have a lover who's more beautiful than you. So why would I want to be your lover? She's terribly offended by this. She accuses him of having propositioned her. And the word comes out about what Lanval said about his lover. And the Basically, he's told, well, you've got a year or so to turn up this so-called beautiful woman, and we will see who's really the most beautiful. And his lover doesn't come to him because, of course, he's violated the taboo. Eventually she does, though. At the very last minute, her servants come riding up and everyone's like, oh, is that your lover? Because those women are really beautiful. And he's like, no, those are very beautiful women, but they're not as beautiful as the one I'm waiting for. Finally, she shows up and everyone's like, oh, my God, she's so beautiful. But in fact, everyone who's around her is way more beautiful than Guinevere. And uh, it, it's proven, basically, Lanval wasn't lying. His lady, whose, name's, whose name incidentally is Sir True Love, goes up to Guinevere, blows in her face, and blinds her. And then she rides off with Sir Lanval, and then we're told two different things about what happens to him. In one stanza, we're told that Lanval, once a year, if you ride out towards that island where he, he disappeared to, he will come out and he will joust with you. You can fight with him and have a nice time of doing some athletic stuff with him. Or just no one ever sees him again. And that's the end of the story, except for Thomas Chester saying, Hi, this is me, Thomas Chester. I told this story. Please pray for me. So the sources of this are stories of fairy. These are widely told stories. We have many of those features here where you cross some barrier. Oftentimes you go into a cave or you cross a river and you meet a being of enormous power on the other side and they offer you something um, that will help you out. On the, but they make some kind of arbitrary demand, some taboo. And then we, had, we get all of those features here. And people have tried to link these things to Celtic mythology, etc. I don't know. Um, we also have Arthurian stories. So there are stories about this legendary King Arthur from very early on in the Middle Ages. 
but these really start to coalesce in the 12th century. One in a Latin work by Geoffrey of Monmouth, The History of the Kings of Britain, which is where we get a lot of the Arthur Stark stuff that we know. We get Merlin, we get Arthur's tragic end, we get the betrayal of the court and so on. So this is a very kind of tragic version of the story. And then we get the romances, the kind of adventure stories, which are told most influentially by a man named Chrétien de Troyes. Um, and that's where we get the stories of Arthur's knights, of Lancelot, Yvain, Gawain, Parseval, and in this case we have Lanval, who's this additional knight. And what you find in the romances is that Arthur is typically, he's the king, but he's kind of a minor character, or he's ineffectual. And that is the case in Thomas Chester's work, as it is, for example, in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. The more immediate source is from a work called Lanval, which is a 12th century work by a person whose name I'll, I'll call her Marita Franz with an English pronunciation. And she wrote a bunch of lays. These lays are short works which are about men and women of the noble class who fall in love and have adventures. And they are oftentimes happy endings, but not always happy endings. But you get basically werewolves, you get talking birds, talking animals of various sorts. You have boats that travel on their own. You have lots and lots of magic. They're very, very exciting stories. And in many ways, they kind of anticipate fairy tales. And the lays are typically done in the vernacular. So Marie wrote in French, and we have a bunch of them in Middle English as well. Uh, the more immediate source is a work called Greylant, which is a very, very similar story to Lanval, which has some additional material. For example, the material about the town, which is lacking in the Marie, uh, and probably most immediately, a Middle English translation of the Marie de France called Sir Landeval. So, Thomas Chester probably didn't know the Marie de France, but he certainly knew the Middle English land of all. He knew Greyland, and there's probably a third source. We don't really know what that was. The poem itself is what's known as a tale rhyme romance. In this case, it's a 12-line stanza that rhymes A-A-B-C-C-B-D-D-B-E-E-B. And you may be inclined to want to count syllables in this to try to figure out what the meter is. I tried to do that. I realized it wasn't working and that, in fact, we have some kind of stress pattern here. It's two four stress lines followed by a three stress line. So it sounds probably something like this. So hit befell in the tenth year. Marlin was Arthur's counselor. He rad him for to end. The king Rion of Irland reeked and fed him there a lady breeked, Gwener his doctor hend. So he did, and home her brought, since Sir Lanville leaked her nocht, ne other knights or hende. For the lady berlos of switch word, that she had lameness under her lord, so fella the rest no end. So, this is a very popular stanzaic form. It's more than 20 other works survive in using this, and it's so popular for these kinds of stories that Chaucer himself does a parody of it in his work, Sir Topas. You will find, I think, that the Middle English is not as hard as some of the things you've encountered before, in part because this is written in the South as a Southern dialect, and the Southern dialect is the ancestor of most modern forms of English. Uh, but I do have the glosses, of course, here on the right side, and I can translate this for you. And then I'll talk about some of the interesting features of the vocabulary. So it happened in the 10th year, Merlin was Arthur's counselor, and he advised him to go to King Rhiannon of Ireland immediately and to fetch there a beautiful lady named Guinevere, his courtly daughter. And so he did and brought her home. But Sir Lanval did not like her nor did any of the other knights who were themselves courtly. For the lady had a reputation of such infamy that she had lovers beside her lord, so many that they were uncountable. There were so many. So this is the standard way that Guinevere is in fact talked about from as far back as like Welsh material from the early Middle Ages. So this is how she's normally presented. Um, some interesting things here about the Middle English, though, you'll see that Artors with that S on the end. In modern English, there would be an apostrophe to mark that as a possessive. Again, Middle English punctuation is not the same as modern punctuation, but we do see an element there of the kind of um, conjugation of this, where genitives are marked with an S, that is, possessives are marked with an S in Middle English as they were sometimes in Old English and as they are still in Modern English. 
Um, we have that famous character Merlin, who appears in this work only once at this point as Arthur's advisor. We have that word errata, which means advised. You maybe are familiar with the English king named Ethelred the Unready. In this case, those are both puns on the word red, advisement. So basically his name could be translated as the honorable advice, Ethelred, the badly advised, because he was badly advised. Wenda is where we get modern English wander. Uh, and you have this in German as well to hike. You can use that word to mean hike. Um, we have los, which I think is an interesting word. So this is related to a, a Latin word laus, which means uh, fame. But the root ultimately of this is the same root as the word for lay, which is the genre of this work, which is a song. You have this in uh, German in, in the uh, leader is a song. Um, you have lemanus lovers. This is the root of this in Old English is the word love man, that person who is your love man, lover man. And then this word fila uh, in German is pretty much the same word spelled V-I-E-L. So if you want to wish someone a lot of luck, you wish them viel Glück in German. And then nas nun. So these are two words that are basically the negative participle smashed together with another word. So nas is not plus was, forms nas. Noon is not plus one equals noon. So more than one is noon. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So the problem in this narrative is that of the court versus the forest. And the court is a place of political compromise. It's corrupt. It's a place where basically nothing really works. You think you should be rewarded and you're not rewarded. You do all the right things and you're still betrayed. In the forest, everything goes right. And so if you imagine that the people who are reading this in many cases are courtiers, they're people at an aristocratic court and they're trying to imagine how their lives could be better. This work is offering a kind of utopia, a solution to that, a place where they imagine that everything works perfectly. So again, to stress this at the court, this is in Marie's version, this is in the Landeval, this is in Thomas Chester's Sir Landeval. We can see that here are some of the problems. Wealth is too limited, women are disloyal, the women are too social, and the exotic is too close. So basically women are being blamed, I think, for the problem of the court in this narrative. And when I say the exotic is too close, I mean that Guinevere is Irish, and Ireland is very, very close to Britain. It is insufficiently far away to be comfortingly exotic. It's just strange, but close, and therefore kind of disruptive. And so in Marie's original, I would say this is also the case in subsequent versions of the story, the forest solves all of these problems because we have infinite wealth. We have a perfectly loyal woman who demands perfect loyalty. We have a woman who is socially attached to only one man, and she's exotic, but far away. She's a fairy. Of course, she's on the other side of the river. But we also have her wealth itself is from Indian sources, from very, very exotic places far away from England, from various Arabic sources, also very exotic, very far away from England. So, so far away, they can just indicate that she has wealth from all over, but not too close, not the wrong kind of foreignness. So that's quite interesting itself. But I would say it's an impossible solution as well, because the only way to have all these things work properly is to leave behind the court altogether and into, enter into a land of pure imagination. And indeed, in um, Marie's version, as in the Middle English Sir Landeval, we have this in this form even, where the fairy princess is riding off and Landeval is begging not to be left behind. And in Marie's version and the Middle English Sir Landeval, he jumps onto the back of her horse and rides off behind her, which really stresses how dominant she has become in those narratives. The only possible solution is to attach yourself to this impossibly rich, impossibly loyal fairy woman. So Thomas Chester adds some additional material. He adds two places to this. Now he's getting this in part from his sources, but I think this is important to remark on. Um, one is the city 
where Lanval encounters his former servant, who's now a mayor. And you recall that he seeks accommodations after he's left the court of Arthur. And this person who used to be a servant says, well, I, it's all full up, honestly, but I can give you this cabin nearby. And so that's where Lanval stays with the two servants who have been sent with him, or the two knights have been sent with him by Arthur, until he spends down all of his money and he falls into debt. Well, if he's fallen in, into debt, that means he has to borrow money. And we're starting to see the way that Lanval has fallen into the economy of the city, which is a place where money is no longer simply a sign of status, of the sort of wealth that you have that indicates your importance in the world, but rather money is something that can be exchanged, invested, and profited from, and you never know what people are going to be from moment to moment. It changes, it uproots everything again. Lanval's servant is now the mayor and is basically able to boss him around because Lanval falls into poverty. Uh, and that is a problem of something that is too close, I would say. And then he also goes off to fight a giant named Sir Valentine in Lombardy, Italy. Now, a giant is, in this case, he's a knight, but the fact that he's in Lombardy is quite important because Lombardy in 14th century England would have been a place where they would have thought these people are primarily bankers. The Italian bankers in Lombardy were really important sources of finance uh, throughout Europe. And so for Lanval to go to Lombardy and to defeat basically an embodied form of finance capitalism itself kill this giant with the aid of his invisible servant that's been provided to him by his fairy lover and then to return home and then to basically be rich and to put the mayor back in his place is i think also very obviously a case of a fantasy wish fulfillment of the problem of being at court and involved in money in certain ways and money being this unpredictable thing so again i would say the solution in all these cases is still impossible you have to go into the fairy world to solve it and i'd say that thomas chester just multiplies the places where people are anxious so we can talk more about this in class hi so in putting together this little talk i read a bunch of the existing scholarship on sir lanval and i've listed this here for you you will find if you want to write about this and many of these things will be useful to you and it also i want to point out there's lots of things that I didn't get a chance to talk about here, including the matter of Guinevere being blinded at the end, which is one of Chester's additions to the story, and also the issue of Lanval and sexuality, which is very, very important in Marie and kind of obscured in the Thomas Chester version. So I'm looking forward to our conversation in class. Thanks so much for listening.